Um, just as a little introduction, um, I am a nurse, as you all know. Um, most of my clinical background has been in either oncology or education, um, two uh, things that I enjoy greatly. So um, oncology has always been something very important to my heart, and um, I am um, really grateful to be able to, to be in this field. So um, I'm going to start out with talking about the importance of self-advocacy as a patient and then also just provide some practical tips. Um, and then we're definitely going to have some time for questions at the end. I don't know if you can have questions, just hold on to those. And um, But what is self-advocacy and why is it so important, especially in our um, medical field today? Um, for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, self-advocacy means that you arm yourself with the tools and skills necessary to feel comfortable about asserting yourself and communicating clearly about your cancer care needs. It ultimately means that you're taking responsibility and assuming some control of your life circumstances with cancer. It implies strength. It requires participation and can contribute to the goal of physical, emotional, and mental health. Um, and the emphasis is on a mutual relationship with your healthcare team. So if you think kind of in the old days, the doctor almost was seen as like the king, you know, and you're kind of at his feet and he or she's going to tell you what to do and then you do it. Well, these days, it you can think of it more as like a round table where everyone's there, everyone has a a seat at the table, everyone's at the same level and can provide their own unique input. Um, so another um, way of uh, referring to self-advocacy or it includes shared decision-making as one of its foundational principles. Um, so that includes you not only receiving input from your healthcare team, but also providing your own back. It's less about an authority making the decision for you and you being an active participant in your care. This is by no means intended to place the entire burden of care on you as a patient though. Um, it's again, it's providing a welcome environment for you to share what's important to you and what you value. So it helps patients gain a sense of control, a sense of stability in your life when probably so much seems out of your control. Um, and implies this idea of shared power. Um, and it's a necessary skill for patients to develop in order to promote autonomy, make your own informed decisions, and your own choices about your life and your health care, as it is your life and it is your body. And it can improve your quality of life and also help you move forward with confidence as you face challenges. Um, preventing you from feeling hopeless or helpless and instead inspiring a sense of hope as you walk along your journey. So that's kind of the background of why it's important and the benefits of self-advocacy. Um, some of the uh, just practical principles you can apply um, starting out is first and foremost, find a provider that you trust. That is foundational. It's crucial for you to have a sense of peace of mind as you walk through your journey. Part of that is knowing that you have found a healthcare provider, a healthcare team that you know welcomes your feedback and your input. <laughs> um, this can also include seeking a second opinion. Um, if you're not sure about the recommendations your provider is making, if you're not sure about your provider, uh, getting a second opinion is a way you can advocate for yourself. It can either give you more options or it can provide peace of mind that the recommendations are in line with another doctor's recommendations. Um, if you ever are in a situation where you are working with a doctor, you mention a second opinion and they seem to not be super excited about that, I would consider that actually a red flag. Any good physician is gonna be open to you getting a second opinion. Um, I usually provide or tell patients that they even bring up that question, should I get a second opinion? Um, I say, I think that just the fact you have that crossed your mind probably means that it would be a good idea. Um, not that that says anything about your provider per se, but just in the future, you would have your own peace of mind that you've done all you can, gathering the information that you need to make the decisions you need to make. 
Um, this can also include finding a support system that you trust. That can include people in your own personal life, your family and your friends, and also other members of the healthcare team that can be there to help guide you, answer questions, um, listen, et cetera. So trusting your provider here first, and then also trust yourself, listen to your body. So you are the only one that's in your body and you are the only one that actually knows what you're experiencing and feeling. Um, so that's an important part of being a self-advocate. Don't gaslight yourself. Don't say, oh, I'm not feeling that way or it's not that bad. If something feels bad, it's uncomfortable, you're not sure about, it's really important that you speak up. Um, trust your instincts, ask for help when you need it. And if you're not sure if you should ask, I would ask. Um, another thing you can do is keep your healthcare provider informed between appointments. Um, I've heard this from a number of patients in my role so far where they are experiencing something, um, but they say, oh, I should wait until I have an appointment in two weeks. I'll just talk about it then. Sometimes that's okay, but oftentimes, especially if you're uncomfortable um, or it's new, or you didn't expect it, you hadn't heard this is normal, you absolutely should reach out and check in with your medical provider. Is this normal? And then there's often something they can do to help you with what you're experiencing and you don't have to be uncomfortable for two weeks so you see them again. So that's another way you can be a good self-advocate. Um, Ashley will touch on this a little bit more, but um, this isn't on my slide, but also just clearly identifying someone that can speak in your behalf. If you are in the event, you are unable to speak for yourself. That can include a self or a advanced directive or have someone in your chart clearly defined as an emergency contact, someone your doctor can talk to if you did. That's another way of being a good self-advocate. Um, so during your care, making the most of your appointments, it's be sure to arrive on time. So you can, or early, so you can maximize the time with your provider. Um, write down what your doctor says during the appointment. It's very easy, especially if you're feeling any sort of emotion during the appointment, your mind may not actually be able to process the same way. So writing things down or better yet, have someone with you that can write things down for you <laughs> that isn't experiencing necessarily the same emotions that you might be. So you can leave the appointment with a clear understanding of expectations, next steps, the plan. Um, if you have something complicated you wish to discuss with your doctor or you're just thinking, you know, I never have time. There's this question that I've always wanted to ask, but I never seem to have time call the doctor's office ahead of time and say, you know, I really want to be sure that I talk about X, Y, and Z during this appointment. So is 15 minutes enough time or however much time they allot, you know, or do we need more time? They can plan in advance and then you can get what you need during that appointment. <laughs> and then the last one is don't leave your appointment without knowing the next steps. Um, Again, this one can be easy. Sometimes it's at the end of the appointment, you're feeling tired, rushed. Um, make sure you have a clear idea of what's coming up next. Um, and then commit to do your part to take responsibility to um, follow through with that in your treatment plan. So that will help your provider trust you as the patient. Um, but if you're not sure what you're going to be, it's gonna be hard to make sure you follow up on that. So be very clear when you leave. Um, the other thing I want to add to this is um, doing your own research or becoming informed about your care um, is really important, but it can also be really overwhelming as a patient. Where do I even go? There's tons of information, especially online, and not all that information might be accurate. Not all that information will apply to you. It depends on your particular situation, scenario, individual story. So that's really where someone like yourself can help you figure out that out your, or your other members of your healthcare team figure out where do I go for information. Um, if that's again where it's a shared experience where the burden does not have to all be on you to figure it out, but yet the patients that are most informed about their condition, treatment, care, 
um, can be the best prepared and um, able to navigate that successfully. So your friendly neighborhood navigator can help point you in the right direction there. Um, making informed decisions is a key part of um, being a self-advocate. Um, so first off, it's clear it's being clear about what is most important to you as a patient. And it's okay if you don't know this right away. It's okay if you don't have to go to your very first appointment and already have a clear idea. But the key is that when you know what you need or what's important to you, that you feel free to share that with your healthcare team. And that way they can tailor the plan that is best for you as an individual. All of the recommendations they make will be based off their own um, understanding of the current research and standards that are out there. So that's what the doctors are going to present to you. Um, however, sometimes their um, goal might be different than what your ultimate goal is. Okay, I'd rather, for example, not do a particular treatment because this potential side effect is so distracting to me that I'd rather see if there's another option would be an example of this. Um, so it's okay to ask if there's other options or alternatives available to what's being recommended. Um, use your nurse navigator, um, your patient navigator, your social worker. We can help you clarify what you value. We can help um, ask you questions to help you think through your decision, things to bring up with your doctor. We won't tell you what decision you need to make, um, but we can help you in that process. Um, so you end up choosing the right path. Um, for yourself. Um, and that can be really hard to do, especially if you're presented with options. Sometimes it's very clear, you know, in your scenario, this is what's recommended. Other times as well, you know, you have a choice between these two options. And that sometimes can be harder um, decision to make. Um, and so that's where we can come in and kind of help you talk through what's important to you. Um, and then it kind of the key at that point is once you feel like you've gotten the decision, the information you need to make your decision um, and you've communicated what you value, um, you feel like you understand your options, is then making a choice and not looking back. It's easier said than done. Um, but if we knew the outcome of the path, the, all the path options, it wouldn't be hard to choose because <laughs> you would know the outcome. So it's the fact that we don't know the outcome that makes it so challenging. So that's where it comes down to being able to identify what you value, um, what's important to you, and then making the decision based off of that. And then if you don't know or understand something, ask. That is so important and that your healthcare team should welcome your questions. Um, and if they don't, that's another maybe fine that maybe you need to look at some other options. Um, and then also understanding every patient's different. This is something I encounter a lot. I talk to some patients when they want to know every detail of every option and what they have, which is great. There's also other patients that say, all I want to know is what I need to know right now. And then I just want to know it as I need to know. And that is also great. So I think that's really important um, that if you feel like and now the healthcare team's job, however, is to make sure you know what you need. That is their job. Um, but if you are okay with, you know, I don't need to know more than that, we can say that. We can communicate that. Um, if you feel like you want more information than what you're getting, again, that's where we could help come into play. You can make another appointment with your doctor and say, I need to know more before I make this decision, or I need to know more before I move through this treatment. That is okay. It's just a matter of knowing what you value and then being able to communicate that with your with your team. Um, and Ashley will talk more about communication um, tips, um, principles. Um, so I'll just mention a couple things, but it's okay to be persistent. Um, if you need a question answered, it's okay to be persistent. There's a difference though between being a cat. I don't even like to use that word because I don't think anyone's ever a but it's it's that idea of being persistent, but also understanding that your healthcare team is busy. They've got other patients that they're working with as well. So sometimes it might take a little while for them to get back to you, but you should always get a response no matter what. 
Um, and if it's something urgent, then you may need to actually seek more of the urgent or emergent care. Um, but you do have a right to getting answers and you do have a right to clarity and you do have the right to receive a response. So, and again, that's something that I can also help with um, if there's ever a situation where that's really, you're not getting what you need because um, that's really important. Um, if something happens that makes you angry, it is okay to express that. It's just, and Ashley will talk about some principles on communication when you're um, and needing to express a frustration, but try to do so in a healthy or constructive way. Um, so it is important that healthcare providers understand if something's not working in their office, if they need to look at um, you know, certain you know, uh, ways things are done, um, so they can also continue to grow and become better as well. Um, and uh, just a reminder that your healthcare providers are people too, and your needs also matter. Um, so just a reminder of the roles of the healthcare team, um, who does what. Um, the doctor is the one that determines the treatment plan, makes the recommendations, um, assesses you, your situation. Um, the NP or PA you guys may interface with also as well, so they can also prescribe, um, assess, answer questions, provide education, the MA um, will more often act as a relay person, relay of information. You can ask the MA a question. They can ask the doctor and then relay that information back to you. What does MA mean? Oh, medical assistant. Okay, right. um, the social worker can help with um, guiding you through processing things like emotions or values or uh, frustrations and um, it can provide some maybe tips on how to communicate with your healthcare team. Um, I'm just talking about context of self-advocacy here. Obviously, social worker does so much more than that. Um, your nurse can help provide education, also help relay information back and forth to the doctor. Um, and then as a nurse navigator, I have a unique role in the sense that I'm, I'm very neutral party, so not being affiliated with any physician or any doctor's office. Um, I am happy to be someone if, that you can call any time and just say whatever you need to say. Um, and I can help you navigate through, okay, well, what are some good next steps? So you can kind of be a little, you know, pretty free with me. Um, and we can talk through whatever you need to talk through and then some next steps. Um, I can also help if you're facing any barriers. Hey, I've called this doctor's office three times and I still haven't heard that. And that's something that I can help um, assist you with. And then the pharmacist, you probably haven't interacted with as much, but um, they, if you ever have really specific medication questions, I'm thinking even the oral chemotherapies, for example, um, you know, they may be able to help um, step in and answer some really specific questions there. Um, and then after treatment and beyond. So this is thinking more towards the survivorship um, or long-term treatment um, situations is um, just staying informed, doing your own, continuing your own research, um, including knowing a long-term or late side effects that can occur um, and being aware of those so you can pay attention for those. Um, attending education seminars, you guys can all check that off with your fear. <laughs> um, so that's why, partly why we, you know, we do what we do is to continue to educate patients and the public, um, and uh, provide you know current credible information. Um, maintain your healthcare records. This is a lot easier nowadays with electronic medical records, but um, even asking at the end of your treatment, can I have a summary of what I received, you know, is there a document that has that there? That's something I could also help with if you um, are interested in that. Um, but just so you can come away knowing, okay, this is this is what I went through. This is um, so you can communicate that in the future if needed. Then being vigilant about your own health. That goes kind of back to the staying informed about the long term great effects. Um, knowing what to expect. Um, it could even be, um, you know, being faithful with your follow-up appointments, um, knowing what to expect as far as how often you're going to do follow-up, um, 
participating in lifestyle recommendations, um, seeking continued emotional support resources as well. Um, so sometimes um, patients experience, you know, it's when they get to the end of the treatment, you're out of survival mode, and then all of a sudden you have space to process emotionally, for example. So it's um, asking for those resources and for what you need when you need it. Ashley, um, I started here in December and going to fresh, but I'm not new. Um, I've been in the community for the last 17 years working in health care. Um, done some time at UCLA Oncology, Mission Hope, and then some home health and hospice. So very familiar to me. Um, but yes, I'm an LCSW, which is a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm doing part time at first, and I'm happy to help anybody with whatever comes up as well. Well, Julie, I should have counted how many times she used the word communication. <laughs> it's a good segue into my part of the topic. So communication is key for you to be a good self-advocate. Um, and that you know applies to partners who are here, caregivers, spouses, everybody. Um, so why, why does communication matter? Um, because you wanna be clear about your treatment plan your prognosis, um, and any available support to help you reduce that uncertainty and, and guide decision-making, Julie talked about. Um, also, clarity about your experience with the medical team and so that they can deliver back the best quality of care with, like Julie said, with what you value, things like that. And effective communication is going to promote that relationship that she talked about, that we want it to be a relationship with your medical team to just be respectful, empathetic, feel connected, feel like you're getting compassionate care as well. And then my take home, which I'll repeat this at the end, you know, it's, it's your responsibility to advocate for yourself. You all know the doctors are so busy. And if you miss a follow-up and maybe they try to reach out to you, they're only going to reach out once or twice. And then what? It all it does fall back on you to make sure you, you're following up with your medical care. <clears throat> okay. So what, what gets in the way of communicating well? Um, lots of things, right? Sometimes we are trying to avoid certain feelings. So maybe we don't want to tell anyone how we actually feel because then I have to admit I'm scared or I'm worried or there's grief. Um, so sometimes maybe we hold back a little bit to avoid those feelings that are uncomfortable. Sometimes we are trying to protect other people. So maybe you have kids and we don't want them, you don't want to talk to them about anything because you don't want them to be sad or be worried or grandkids, whomever in your life that you are trying to protect. Or maybe I hear a lot, you know, I don't want to be a burden. So if I if I talk to, you know, whoever's helping me at home, it's going to make it worse, or I don't want them to feel bad, that sort of thing. Um, another thing that gets in the way is our desire to be a good patient. Who wants to be, want to be labeled a good patient, right? So what, what does that actually mean, you know? Um, that could be, you know, you don't want to be labeled as a complainer, right? You don't want the staff whispering about you when you come in and <laughs> they remember how you were the last time. So those sorts of things. Um, people pleasing, I think a lot of us do this, um, especially when I think about like neighbors or people who are not really in your circle who maybe come and ask a lot of questions about your treatment and maybe you don't really want to talk to them, but you want to please everybody. And you're, you know, it's nice that they ask you questions that maybe you go along with it, but you really don't want to, but the communication won't be as good that way. And then uh, pressure for positive thinking. How many of you have heard, just think positive. <laughs> Well, if it were that easy, none of us would be here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we sometimes think, you know, I'm not going to let anything negative come out of my mouth because then it's just going to go down, get on the slide. And um, so, you know, in all these ways, 
communication can be difficult. You know, something that seems so simple can really get muddy. So how can we address these things? So the top one is gonna be name it to tame it. So instead of avoiding our difficult feelings, we need to just call it what it is, let it be what it is, accept it in a non-judgmental way if you can, easier said than done, but definitely more effective than avoiding your feelings. Um, to desiring to protect others, we can actually share closeness, trust, and support. So sharing, whether that's like Julie met your family, your friends, your healthcare team, the support group, whatever it is that you find. Um, but I also want to say with this too, that not everyone's entitled to have that kind of relationship with you. Like boundaries are important too. Um, but you need to find somebody where you can just really tell them how you feel. Like Julie said, you can call her and tell her how it is, right? So, me too. Um, we can also, the collaborative process, I think we've touched on that. Um, yeah, medical, your providers can't be effective if they don't know what's really going on. So if you're trying to be a good patient and you're not saying the real things, they're not gonna know. And then they're not gonna be able to help you with better managed side effects, or you know, if you're wanting to focus on quality of life more, you know, different things like that. They have to know, you have to be honest. Work as a team. Um, I think the, the main thing is for the communication to be clear, friendly, firm, and polite. Right, being clear and being kind. Um, and so just to give you an example too. If you are contacting your provider through a portal and you send a five paragraph essay, you think that's gonna go over well? Is that a good way to communicate? No. First of all, they're probably not gonna get through the first three lines and even hear you. So be clear, be firm. Be polite, be precise. Um, and then we know we know with research shows the benefit that expressing our emotions and um, even the uncomfortable ones is more effective than this idea of positive thinking or toxic positivity. So it would be more helpful to be honest about how you feel. And also, um, you can have. You can have both things at the same time. I see a lot of people, with, we, call, we call kind of all the things on the left cognitive distortions in psychology. Those are all things that trip us up that help that we need to get past to be more effective in life, help with more helpful thinking. Um, and that's one of them, like it has to be one way or the other. You can be hopeful and grateful and also feel worried and scared. They can all coexist. So don't feel like you're stuck one way. So hopefully those kinds of tips will help you communicate better. Um, I think Julie touched on some of these too, but communicating at and in between appointments, definitely know, you know, in between appointments how what's the best way your doctor wants you to communicate with them. Do they want you to use the portal? Do they want you to call? You know, just be clear about that. Julie mentioned taking notes at your appointments, um, having a second set of ears, documenting your symptoms. Does anybody journal like in between? Yeah, okay. So that can be very helpful because do we remember what we had for breakfast two days ago? Probably not, so jot it down. Because if, if it's three weeks between your appointments and they ask you how you've been, you're probably only gonna reflect on those first couple days after treatment, maybe, and then maybe the day before yesterday. <laughs> There'll be some space in between. Um, just want you as an advocate to ask questions, share your concerns. Again, like Julie said, if you don't understand something, ask them to explain it to you. So I'm going to translate the conversation. I think I need translation here, but we bring that up too. Um, Okay. 
So here's some strategies for effective communication. You want to identify your objective. So I think of this a lot. Obviously, not every conversation you're not going to walk through these steps. But if it's something really important to you, this is kind of a guide to help you. So what's your objective? I want my doctor to understand this, that, or the other, right? How are you going to communicate that, verbal or written? So if it's, I have had multiple patients do something in writing, give it to the doctor beforehand so that those questions can be answered thoroughly. Mm -hmm. You all know that there are time frames with you are very short. Um, and oftentimes someone like me, um, I know at UCLA there's a social worker, there's a social worker at Southern Fusion that you can, can ch chat with and have them kind of advocate for you on, the, on that side of you know, give that written report to the doctor ahead of time. So feel free to utilize the team. But sometimes written is better, especially if it's something we're emotional about, something we can't do, we can't get through face to face. We like to do um, write notes, even that's if it's a mental script that you want to go over in your head ahead of time. And then using I statements is a great communication strategy. Um, it really can take if there's you think someone might get defensive, it really takes that off of the conversation. So an I statement, for example, um, I feel like you are not listening to me when you continue to offer this treatment I said no to, or I need you, um, I need more time with you next visit because I'm not feeling like you're understanding where I'm coming from. See how it kind of takes it back. It's a little bit easier for people to, to hear. Like I said before, be clear, concise, and concrete. And then active listening. Um, active listening is basically reflecting back what someone's telling you. Oftentimes that's very helpful. Like if you feel like the person you're talking to is just kind of rising and you're not getting anywhere, it can be really helpful to say. I hear what you're saying. This is where I'm coming from. Just make sure people feel heard, just like you want to feel heard in the same way. And then check in with your emotions. So a lot of times, right, our emotions take over. We don't say the things we want to say or how we'd like to say them. Just, just awareness, really. And then consider your nonverbal communication, right? I'm tossed and mad. Let's do facial expressions, um, posture, volume, all those things. And then some people are not, this self-advocacy thing is just not something that they can master, maybe. Or maybe you're just really not feeling well to do this on your own. So who, like Julie said earlier, who makes your decisions when you can't? Who is your emergency contact? who is on your advanced directive. <laughs> Very important for everyone to have one piece, just in case you're in a position where you can't make a medical decision on your own, or some people will just have someone else do it for them if it's too much. So we have a lot of those if we need one. Okay. So these are just four communication styles you have Passive, passive aggressive, aggressive or assertive. So the goal in green is to be assertive. Um, I think we probably all know someone, if not ourselves, that fit in one of the other colors. <laughs> but um, yeah, I won't read through these, but we definitely wanna be assertive. And that is someone who communicates ideas directly and honestly, shows emotional intelligence. So what we mean about that is being aware of your own emotions and how they're being reflected. Um, using relaxed gestures, making eye contact, and collaborating with your team member. That's the goal. Okay. So we'll give you just a quick example. Um, say the situation is you are going to your infusion appointment or your doctor appointment. You're already frustrated before you get there because there was traffic and the appointment time is not when you wanted it and nobody calls back. You're, you're, not, 
<laughs> so how does the passive person respond when the doctor says, how are you today? The passive person says, I'm fine. No real complaints, just tired from the day. Does that reflect how they were feeling? The aggressive person says, I'm seething because I had to spend hours in miserable traffic because your stupid staff forgot to step in the morning. Like, are you going to get what you want? Maybe you respond that way. Maybe not. Your passive aggressive response would be side effects are fine, but sitting in traffic to get here makes me want to quit the whole thing. One day I just might not show up. There's kind of like right in there. Best way to respond. Doctor says, How are you today? I know the clinic is very busy. I want to request middle of the day appointments rather than afternoon, please. I'm finding the fatigue and discomfort from being in the car for so long is too hard for me to manage. I would be grateful if you could make that change. Clear, concise, you validated how you feel. <laughs> You asked for what you wanted. Yeah, you made it clear. And I think, especially in oncology or really in the medical field, like we feel it, we know, and we don't mind when people are really upset because you need a safe space to express that sometimes. So I think just knowing who to express it to, you come at your doctors around the way, and that's the hub of your medical team. We want to have that good working relationship. And I think, especially in oncology or really in the medical field, like we feel it, we know, and we don't mind when people are really upset because you need a safe space to express that sometimes. So I think just knowing who to express it to, you come at your doctors around the way, and that's the hub of your medical team. We want to have that good working relationship. And I think, especially in oncology or really in the medical field, like we feel it, we know, and we don't mind when people are really upset because you need a safe space to express that sometimes. So I think just knowing who to express it to, you come at your doctors around the way, and that's the hub of your medical team. We want to have that good working relationship. And I think, especially in oncology or really in the medical field, like we feel it, we know, and we don't mind when people are really upset because you need a safe space to express that sometimes. So I think just knowing who to express it to, you come at your doctors around the way, and that's the hub of your medical team. We want to have that good working relationship. And I think, especially in oncology or really in the medical field, like we feel it, we know, and we don't mind when people are really upset because you need a safe space to express that sometimes. So I think just knowing who to express it to, you come at your doctors around the way, and that's the hub of your medical team. We want to have that good working relationship. In this setting, I don't feel like I'm the director, I'm a patient. So make sure you put that hat on. Um, and then I'll give you my disclaimer. Um, I am not a doctor. I am not a medical professional in any fashion. So everything that I say is as a patient and a patient only. I am an almost 19 year two-time cancer survivor. Um, and so that is the hat I wear with you guys tonight. Um, I'm a proactive patient and a survivor and a thriver in the face of many, many challenges. Um, Steve Martin said, be so good, they can't ignore you. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to absolutely give credit to these two for um, all the things they shared tonight. Um, but I don't want what I share to look like chronic positivity because it's really not, but there's a lot of things that I take to heart that I do put in the positive lane, um, which is hence, you're gonna see a, a bunch of quotes in here that are very positive, but um, they're also 
measured by the amount of things that I've been through that you just can't get through if you don't have a little bit of positive outlook. Um, so every day may not be good, but there's something good in every day. Um, so that is kind of what I, where I have to put things because, you know, with cancer, especially, um, in my world with cancer recurrence, there's challenges. There's always going to be challenges, but I have to find like the reasons to move forward and go on. All right. So this is, um, my cancer story, um, started in 2005. Um, they say you're diagnosed with cancer. Now what? Um, I was, uh, it was my 32nd birthday. Um, so I was super young. Um, they said young people don't get breast cancer. So, um, yeah, that was fun. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to learn how to make a thousand decisions all at once. They say you have cancer. Oh my gosh, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. And it's like a foreign language. You guys all know this. Um, but you have to learn how to make decisions really well measured and in a short period of time, but you can't rush something like your life. So, um, you have to learn a new language, like I said, stage, lymph node status, receptor status, um, a lot of things like that. Um, am I going to die? That's a very big question that we ask ourselves as patients um, that nobody likes to talk about. Um, and how do I move forward? So there's uh, the husband, and that was me the first time I lost my hair. And there is me with my daughter. That was my oldest at the time of three. So um, you can tell that uh, my kids were small. Uh, this was my second cancer journey. Um, I, as you can see from the stitches in my scalp, um, I had a recurrence as a brain tumor um, in 2019. So um, I get the gratitude to blame everything that I want on either chemotherapy or brain surgery, right? Mm -hmm. we, <laughs> we, if I forget something, oh well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I tried to put all of the things that I've learned in my cancer journey um, together so that I can share them because there were so many potholes that I felt like I had to navigate. I always try to share them um, with people that understand. So I know that you guys um, need these um, tidbits. Um, so I looked at all the, I like to look at all the things that promote wellness, um, whether it's my insurance or my medications, because obviously medications, as much as they have side effects, they are the reason I am standing here today. Um, supplements and herbs also very important. Um, but you have to be careful with them and you have to be very honest with your team and your oncologist in particular, if you're going to supplement or take herbs, um, diet. And I don't mean weight loss diet. I mean, food, what you put in your body, um, exercise, mental health, um, relaxation and stress reduction support. Um, I will talk about this again and again. Um, the support system that I've had over the years, the cancer survivors in my life are a tremendous force in my world. Um, and then also reducing toxins. And um, there's all different kinds of toxins that I'll talk about as well. Um, so what not to do? Um, don't put your head in the sand. That's why we have the um, ostrich with his head in the sand and ignore the cancer. I chose not to be the kind of person that's like, oh, it'll be fine, it'll go away. It's like the flu. Um, because I heard that. Um, and I chose not to do that because I felt like it was too chronic positivity, like, oh, we'll just ignore it. Um, do not go against your doctor's orders. That's kind of something I'm big about. Um, I, I don't like to, I mean, I, I, like they had both said, you're part of the team, but I also like to listen to that and not, you know, ignore the fact that if he says, call me when your temperature is 103, I call when my temperature is 103. Um, do not believe every infomercial, especially the ones in the dark of night, because you know we all have insomnia. Don't believe the ones in the dark of night that say the secret to curing cancer is in some juice. It is not. Thanks. Um, don't get medical advice from the guy in the vitamin aisle at the health food store. <laughs> really big on that because lots of people tell you, oh, it's only because you're not taking this supplement that costs at eight hundred dollars. So. Um, so I'm big on that. Um, and then do not put too much faith in the internet or what social media and the media across the board says. Um, the media I found is very um, like, oh, we found the cure to cancer. Okay, there's not just one cancer out there. There's a lot of them. So um, be uh, mindful of that. Medicine in America, we have choices. You can choose your doctors. You can choose your health insurance sometimes. 
You can choose where you get your scans. You can choose where you get your biopsies. There's a lot of choices we have um, that I think are a huge blessing, especially my one of my favorite things about being in this area. And I know um, some of your stories, not all of them, but um, we get to go north or south or we get to have care here or we get to do a hybrid. Um, I've had some of my care in San Francisco. I've had some of my care very local. Um, and I, you know, I can't say enough about how blessed we are that we have so much great medicine here, but also so much great medicine relatively nearby. Um, so you get to choose. Um, where to find your doctors, also a great, great thing to look into. Um, choosing your kind of care. Like I said, do you, do you want to add um, supplements to your care? Do you want to just have, you know, whatever your oncologist says or whatever your radiation oncologist says? You get to choose. Um, and like Julie mentioned, it's not just, you know, it's about finding the doctor and the care that's right for you. Um, it's, you know, you could have one doctor that says, oh, you need this, 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 and this, and it might be like throwing the kitchen sink. And you're like, uh, but I don't want to throw the kitchen sink. Or it could be the opposite. You could have somebody that's too like, oh, your cancer is no big deal. And you're like, <laughs> really? It totally is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about finding that level of um, support for you and finding somebody you trust. And then I also wrote on here about asking around because I'm a huge fan of asking the people I know. I ask nurses, I ask doctors, I ask friends, I ask my hairdresser, you know, who, who's really, who, who's got the buzz on, you know, who I need to see for this. Um, or, you know, is it really also um, uh, right now at 19 years, I ask doctors for length a lot. Like, should I stay here? Should I go out there? Should I, you know? Um, so because he's kind of my quarterback and the, he's really honest with me. He's like, you know, for that, maybe you should go elsewhere. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that. So I did throw some jokes in more and more. My patients are going to the internet for medical advice to keep my practice going. I changed my name to Dr. Google. <laughs> um, Dr. Google is, a is a common thing I make reference to, um, because I feel like so many people get too many answers from the internet. The internet can be a great tool. It can be terribly frightening too. One of my girlfriends who's a cancer survivor, she's actually like 22 year cancer survivor. She said, I think if you ask Google, we're all two clicks from dead. So don't ask Google. <laughs> um, so build, how to build your dream team. Uh, pick a captain. Sometimes I'm the captain. Sometimes my oncologist is the captain. Sometimes somebody else is the captain. But um, remember to pick a captain and remember you're part of the team. Um, both Ashley and Julie touched on this, that you know, you sit at the table. Don't, don't think that you don't. Um, uh, I can tell you, I get great care because I'm a part of the team. There are days when the oncologist comes in and says, I think we're going to do this, this, and this. And I go, hey, what about this that you said last time? Or what about this that you said three months ago? Or what about this test that we're not looking at? Um, what about the scan I got last time? Do we really need to be that aggressive or should we be more aggressive? Um, and so not that I, like I said, not a doctor, um, but I like to like pay attention and be an informed patient so I can be part of the conversation. And I tell you, there's lots of times and lots of actually, lots of physicians on my medical team that have said over time, like, oh, that's a great point. Let's, let's, let's do that. Let's follow that, this direction. Um, and I wouldn't, if I wasn't as engaged in my care, I definitely would not get that as that level of care. Um, get second opinions when you need them. Get third opinions, fourth opinions. Sorry, I'm big on opinions. Um, obviously, I, uh, Dr. Spillane has been my oncologist the whole time I've had cancer. Like I say, I know when he had air. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I still am a fan of getting uh, extra opinions if you feel that need to ask questions. Um, and like Julie mentioned, if your doctor has a problem with you getting a second opinion, maybe there's a reason. Um, but Dr. Splane's always encouraged me, like, if you have questions that I can answer, let's, let's, let's dig in. And he's happy to help me find somebody. Like, let me get you an oncologist at Stanford. So, um, that can be a really great, um, great thing. Ask for recommended recommendations. I said that in the previous slide, um, ask, uh, the physician who you would, who they would send their loved ones to. That's really important. Um, when I was very, very first diagnosed, um, the radiologist actually who um, said, this is cancer. Um, I said, you know, he was like, you're the age of my daughter. This is terrifying. Um, and I said, well, where would you go? Where would you send your wife or your daughter? And he was like, I would go here. And I'm like, thank you. 
they won't all necessarily tell you that, but if you ask the question, they'll at least give you like something. Um, and then check the internet, but use good judgment. Maybe, okay. It's a simple procedure. I'm blindfolded, spun around, and then they attempt to reattach your tail. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I always like um, how Julie said, make sure they explain things um, in a way that you understand in layman's terms. I, I super appreciate that because sometimes doctors get into their land and they forget, like, we don't all speak this language. Like, help me out. Um, so self-advocacy, I also like to do my homework, which I mentioned, um, learn enough so that you have educated questions to ask. I love Julie's tidbit about taking notes or even calling in beforehand, but um, making sure that you have the questions that you want answered so that you can really get the best care possible um, because you don't get what you don't ask for. Um, don't take medical advice from the vitamin store. Apparently that was so important. I wrote it twice. So, <laughs> that, but because I had chemo and brain surgery, I, I didn't, I forgot it was there. Um, decide with your doctor, what is the most important, um, to you as well as what is the most important, um, for your cancer care, because sometimes those things aren't necessarily aligned. Like I said, sometimes they'll want to just like cure you at all costs or like give up at all costs. And sometimes your, um, your goals like somewhere in between. Um, I've been told that I have more tumors than they can count. I've been here five years since then. So that's, you know, there was a part of me that was like, okay, well, all right, I guess I'll get my affairs in order. And I did, as you mentioned, we should all get our affairs in order and we should all have our um, paperwork together, which Ashley mentioned as well. Um, whether it's a post or a, 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 a advanced directive um, or your will or any of that stuff. And I'm not going to go way down that lane, but I think that's smart for us all to do. But um, certainly um, to just come to a decision with your doctor about what your goals are um, and, and to make sure that they're understood. And then sometimes we outlive our goals. So who knows? Um, seek out people who make you feel stronger. And it's not that's not just about your medical team. That's about your friends, your family, the people you have in your life. Um, and, uh, apparently we all said take notes. So I think taking notes is important. <laughs> um, okay. So closing the gaps, um, here's a few of my cheats that I, um, always rely on, um, protect your energy, um, and feel free to stop me in this. If you guys have questions about this, but this, I just mean like, you know, we only have, especially as cancer patients, we only have so much energy. Make sure you're giving it to the right place. Um, don't overdo your limits. Um, because that can be super draining and then you don't have enough to give back to yourself. Save your light, same kind of thing. Find balance. Balance is so key in my world. Have gratitude. That's also super key. Have kindness, protect and re uh, refresh your inner peace and your mental health. I cannot say enough about therapy, social work, support groups, friends that don't drain me. I cannot say enough about how much that helps me with my inner peace and my mental health going through this, because it's terrifying to know that, well, that you're going to die. <laughs> um, but that reality doesn't really come to everybody in their, you know, young life. Um, like it does to a cancer patient. Um, so that reality is kind of forward in our world. Um, so I say, you know, find that, um, learn your boundaries and find your voice. Like what Ashley was saying, find ways to stick up for yourself, speak up for yourself. Um, Find your tribe. Um, several of you are part of my tribe. <laughs> um, learn your side effects. Oh, I can't tell you enough. Um, I, I'm a fan of not reading the side effect profile because I will always get everything that the little memo says. <laughs> oh, you could have a headache. <gasps> oh, you could have a toe. <gasps> okay. So I don't read the side effects, but I do learn what they are. Oh, that's going to cost me to be constipated. Okay, well, I'll know that. That one's going to cause diarrhea. Oh, I'm going to know that. I'll take those two on the same day. Maybe we'll have a balance. <laughs> um, but know your side effects. I can't explain thorough enough about how helpful it is so that you don't panic every time you get a headache. Because, you know, we get a headache, we think it's brain tumor. I didn't have a headache when I had a brain tumor. Go figure. <laughs> so there's that. Right? Did you? No. See? <laughs> so, um... Self-care, wellness, meditation, medication, those are my two M words together, um, rest and sleep, um, spirituality, and that can mean all different kinds of things. That could be religion, or it could just mean, you know, like 
when I need my spiritual place, I go to the ocean. Um, I feel like God's there too, but I also feel that need of like nature. Um, eating for wellness because food can be medicine. Um, we have a phenomenal dietitian um, that is available for you guys to utilize, but um, I can't tell you how much the use of a dietitian and the support of eating well has helped me. Um, whether it's actually worked on my cancer or not, I can't tell you that, but it's helped me feel better. Um, hydrate, very important. Travel, that's something that I recently picked up again. A friend of mine was sitting in the back of the room <laughs> and I um, uh, both travel a lot and we kind of like plan our travel around the fact that, you know what? Huh, we have a bucket list, we feel good. It's all, we're gonna go. So um, that's important to me. I think exercise I already said, but it's on there again. Um, friends and family, super important. And then declutter, 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 declutter. I can't tell you, I used to have like a fancy house, a fancy this, a fancy that. And now I'm like, super simple. My clothes came from Costco. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's just like a, a super like simple um, uh, way to just kind of like get rid of the, the background noise. This is a very special part of my tribe. Obviously, I have a lot of other friends who aren't in here, but these are some really special friends of mine, all cancer survivors, and look at them all, not old. So um, young people do get cancer, even though I was told young people don't get cancer. Um, people often ask me about what I purged out of my life that um, has been a, become a cornerstone for me. So I wanted to share this with you. Um, the left is just um, like some tidbits I have and the right is my list, um, but finding consciousness about toxins. And I don't mean like deciding everything is evil and trying to get it all out of your world because it's never going to work. It's just going to make you stressed. Um, but um, finding those and just giving yourself, a, you know, an understanding of them. Um, stress can be a toxin. I've tried to move that out of my life as much as possible except for maybe public speaking, but that's just different. <laughs> um, building in wellness activities. I try to build in places where I can give myself grace and give myself time to have mental wellness, whether it's my cup of coffee in the morning or when I put lotion on my hands in the middle of the workday that's a little bit stressful or you know things like that. I try to build in wellness activities, whether they're large or small. Um, swirling the drain as a toxin. We talked about this a little while ago about like going there and I believe it was the woman in the back who said not to camp there. I love that. That's like, I always say like, don't move in. You can visit the drain, which don't live there um, because it can be really, really taxing and really toxic. Um, so I, you know, obviously with cancer, we, we see the drain and we see it a lot, but you can't like move in. Um, too much information is, is something that I take to heart that I don't want to let myself be burdened with. Um, and, uh, and that means like all the buzz, like, you know, I'm really terribly worried about who we're going to have as the president, but I just like, mm, it'll be fine. <laughs> so I do have a little talk with positivity there. I'm sorry. Because <laughs> what are we going to do? I'm going to fix it. I'm not going to run. So that'll be fine. Um, find balance and don't let the things in the larger world that you can't control, don't let them overwhelm you. Um, Make a few important changes, but don't make them all at once. This would be something that I, you know, I get asked this a lot because I've been doing this for 19 years, but I made a few changes a year in my life. So don't like think, oh, I'm going to go vegan and then I'm going to exercise daily and then I'm going to, and then it's so overwhelming. Don't take it all in baby steps. Um, make a few important changes um, and then do them all in moderation. I'm a huge fan of like, don't give up every single vice that you have. I can't, like, coffee is like a not negotiable for me. I am going to have it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Spillane can tell me it's bad for me. He hasn't. So there's that. But um, it's a vice that I have. I need it. Um, so it's one that I keep. Um, but so here's some of mine that I've given up over the years that I think have been positive, but that I do let myself have occasionally. Soda, sugar, I try to, it was Valentine's Day yesterday. Let's be serious. I did eat chocolate. Um, alcohol, I try to have very, very moderation, um, the news and by the news, I mean like anything that comes through, like the actual news. Um, I don't watch it hardly ever. I try not to, and I like hear about things. This is kind of like my talk, toxic positivity land. People go, oh my God, wasn't that a horrible earthquake that happened like three days ago? And I'm like, 
Oh, did thousands of people die? Because I don't care about it. <laughs> so that's just one of the places that somebody told me at one point in time, just stop watching the news, Shannon. It's freaking you out. So mm -hmm. I stopped. Um, social media, I try to like, you know, pace myself and not stare at it too much. Um, scary and sad movies. That's my friend giving me grief about this. I can't watch scary movies. I can't watch sad movies. If somebody dies of anything, if the dog dies, I can't do it. I, I, cartoons are like my best friend because I can totally count on them. The Hallmark Channel, I could pretty much count on it. Yeah. But um, so that's something I just like limit myself to because it, the other way I just feel the stress of like, oh, that was such a like dramatic movie. It's terrible. Um, and highly processed foods. I eat one hot dog a year and it's on the 4th of July mm -hmm. because I, ha I have to do that, right? It's got to be done. So, but those are some things that I've given up myself. Um, and there's only like two more slides. So hang with me. Um, this is something uh, that I was told very early on. You're a statistic of one. I was so worried. The numbers were not in my favor when I was diagnosed at 32. They were so not in my favor. And I don't even know if I mentioned I was stage three C. I had like 12 positive lymph nodes. It was really bad. Um, and he just said, you're a statistic of one. You, you go be one. Somebody's got to be on the positive side. And I was like, yay, I got to be the other side. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, but you're your own best advocate. Um, like Julie mentioned, if somebody doesn't feel right, pay attention to your body. You're the one who knows it best. Um, also, don't take your health for granted. I that, That's part of why I travel. I'm like, I feel well enough to travel. I'm going to travel. I might only get to go like down the street because I might have worn out of my savings account and not be able to go somewhere super fun. But um, I, you know, I call it travel. Um, you're a survivor. This is just my mantra. Again, not a doctor. You're a survivor from the moment you choose to fight. People are like, well, when do I become a survivor? Is it this day? Is it this day? Which day do I celebrate? Is it the day I had my tumor removed? Is it the day I graduated from chemo? I'm like, I don't know. It was the day I decided that I was going to kick cancers. You know what? So that's where I consider I'm a survivor from. Um, this is one of my favorite um lines, even though it's from Live Strong, which is a little bit of a dirty word now, but back when I started, it wasn't a dirty word. So um, unity is strength, knowledge is power, and attitude is everything. Um, so I just really like that. Make peace. Oh, I can't say enough. Um, make peace with your body, make peace with your disease, make peace with your spirit. Um, I can't tell you how much I get from just making peace. I, the cancer's still there. It's it's gonna always be there. It's a part of my life. It's my in and my out and my my days. It's there, but I've made peace with it um, enough so that it doesn't torture every day. Um, and then there's a little quote in here from Garth Brooks: "I'll never reach my destination if I never try." Um, and then the last thing on this page says, "Give yourself grace." And I believe somebody in this room might have been during Ashley's talk said grace. It's such, it's such a big way for me. Um, grace. Give yourself grace. Give your doctors grace. Give the people in the world grace. Um, so this is me um, about having goals and dreams. Um, this is me at SoFi Stadium. Um, I'm right here um, on the 32-yard line. <laughs> so, woo -woo. And on the Jumbotron, my, my family was in the upper deck, like the upper deck. <laughs> so they said mom we got you on the jumbotron I'm like perfect because you couldn't see me on the 32 yard line but this is really just about you know even though cancer is a part of my daily life it's about finding ways to find joy and finding ways to really live and saying yes when you can when your crazy friend says I nominate you to stand on sort by stadium during Monday night football and you're like great what day is that and she's like in two days and it's on Monday so you gotta take the day off and I was like I'll be there so um, it's really, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's about where you, you find that you can say yes, and you can um, find your joy, but also keep your boundaries. Um, this is my squad. They were little when I got sick. This is them a couple years ago. My, um, my kid, my twins were two when I was diagnosed the first time. And um, so I took them to Disneyland. We won't talk about it. My dad bought us any passes for five years. So we took them a lot. Um, and then, uh, just recently we took them again. So, mm -hmm. and then this is, uh, Kobe Bryant, the man, the myth, the legend, everything negative pressure challenges is an opportunity for me to rise. So every time the doctor says that you have a challenge, I'm like, great, 
I'm gonna find a way to rise. <laughs> so that is it for me.